Welcome to the office. This is a, I filmed this before, this is the changing room off the dojo. It's a dojo up there. Come down some stairs, there's a little kendo gear hanging out on the judo gear. I sit out here and pretend I'm a big shot <laughs> on my own. I just want, this is a little, little video just, uh, I've seen on my break at, on my break at work and uh, check social media and that and um, a few martial arts sites and a couple of, um, been going about Ashida Kim, like, you yeah, know, calling him out and quite rightly because it's a load of crap, obviously. But I just got so nostalgic watching it because I remember when Ashida Kim came out, he used to get his videos and they're like sent from the States because, you know, we were in, in England and this is pre-internet and we're always a bit backward in England anyway. I mean, we were asked to get cable TV and whatever, even then, like this is 88, 89. And a mate of mine used to get like these videos of learn the magic the proper the proper bullshito stuff that that but it was so exciting when you were like 12 it was like learn the you know learn the magic hand of death and so stuff but this is shida kim stuff and i just got so nostalgic seeing it and i can't deny that i just really like his videos now it's just to feel oh, feel that I, i'm i'm 47 in a couple of months or three months and just to see that in uh shida kim again and just remember when you felt that, that, that there was possibly some magic that you could learn before you realised that, well, for me, that it was it's just sheer hard work. And there's no shortcut, there's no magic, there's no mystical man in the mountain in somewhere in China that's going to teach you the, you know, you have to touch Mike Tyson here and he obligingly falls on the floor or something. All that is just absolutely rubbish, obviously. But um, I still feel that sense of uh, nostalgia for all those sort of videos. There was a few of them out and... Ashida Kim on, they were, they were hysterical. It's like he'd have his helper. They were all dressed up like ninjas as well. And he'd have his helper, like, um, put a plastic ring around him to show he could levitate over it. I think it was called, like, the technique to float like the wind or something. But he just, he'd raise himself up. I, I can't show you. He'd be, like, kneeling on the floor, just raise himself up slightly. So they'd pass the ring under under his buttocks. But it would not, they wouldn't pull it all the way through, obviously, because the backs of his knees were stopping it. But you're meant to believe that he was somehow levitating off the floor. This is like no special effects. You just had to take his word that I won't complete the move, but you could, I could if I wanted to. And um, yeah, it's just funny that there's still, still people are going for him. And I think he had that $10,000 challenge and a number of people have, I mean, proper serious martial artists have tried to pin him down on that one over the years. And he's like always found a way to wriggle out of it. You know, if you could defeat him, he'd give you $10,000, but there's so many rules and regulations weighed in his favor. Uh, yeah, I just, I just, I just took back to that time and that being twelve, thirteen, and watching their mates, mates' living room on video, and the smell of the chip shop nearby, and it was run by a, a Chinese family. So that was the first. It's, just, it's a weird thing to say, but it's the first time I, I sort of got into the the Middle East, uh, the Far East. Sorry, it's like all the Buddhas and stuff hanging up in there because they were a very Buddhist family. That's when I first started to get my fascination in the Far East, the videos as well. It wasn't just the Shida Kim, you get his proper, the old, you know, the dubbed Kung Fu movies and stuff. And then, of course, we had Monkey Magic playing on the TV. And so we took up judo and tried karate, tried it for a while before I took up properly and taekwondo and Wing Chun and lots of stuff. But I feel like it's come full circle, really, being at this, being at this temple in Japan and doing the breaking, because that's the thing that, until I, I got breaking, so to speak, I, I didn't feel like I, nothing connected, but when I, it made sense. That's, that's what motivates me to do, even if I don't feel like training at all. Like, I just feel really achy and crap and shit and old. <laughs> but I still, that, that's what inspires me to do it. Before I wouldn't offer, I said, oh no, I'm, 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 I'll have a day off or something. And, uh, but I think everyone has to find that. You have to find the thing that suits you. For a lot of people, it seems to be Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm going for a bit of a, ra a, a tangent here. A lot of people say, oh, I tried this, that, and that. They might have done, you know, I got my black belt in whatever, Taekwondo, and then I found Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and that's that's the thing for me. A lot of people seem to say that. But, so I think you have to find the thing that, you know, and for me it's like breaking bricks and stuff in a Japanese temple, obviously surrounded by, like, Far Eastern stuff. It, it seems to, it, it makes sense for me, and I just... Um, yeah, then I see, I look back and I see the Ishida Kim videos and stuff. I remember how it started, geez, you know, 30, it's 35 years ago now. And a uh, nice bit of nostalgia, but it's funny to see people calling out and stuff because I still remember when we all thought it was totally legit and cool and stuff and 
part of me still does think is really cool, if not legit at all.